and um, welcome to our second um, webinar of the series. And uh, just so that you know, um, we have recorded the uh, first series, and that's going to be available soon on the uh, web page in the Dimension Learning Centre, along with this session. So we are recording this today, and you can access that. And also, we're going to send a survey after the um, session. So it's new technology, and um, we're trying our very best to give you a really great session today. And we're going to, um, our guest speaker today is um, Yvonne, and she works at Waitemata District uh, Health Board, and she's a dementia specialist nurse. So she's got a really interesting session for you today, and we're really looking now at the behaviour particularly that can be challenging in dementia. So I'm hoping you're enjoying it, and um, we'll get started shortly. Hi everyone. Um, as Gail said, I'm Yvonne Werner, the Dementia Nurse Specialist from Waitemata DHB, but today I'm presenting on behalf of Alzheimer's New Zealand. When we're talking about dementia, it's really important to remind ourselves that these people have difficulties in many spheres of their life, not just with their memory. So there's difficulties with memory, difficulties with thinking, difficulties with communication, and difficulties with function. And all of these things overlap, like our memory affects our functioning, our communication affects our functioning, and all of them interact with each other. The next big thing that I think is really important, and it is a theory called the progressively lowered stress threshold. Some of you may have already heard of this. Um, it was developed by a Dr. Buckwater. And as we age, our stress thresholds progressively become lower. But there's been a lot of work done on dementia and it's even lower for these people. So if you think about when you're younger or you've got teenagers and they come home from school and they're hanging off the fridge door, grazing, eating the fridge out like a locust and they're flicking through Netflix and they're um, sending text messages and they're tweeting, twatting, twatting, <laughs> whatever they do, all at the same time. They can do that their stress threshold allows them to do that. The focus becomes narrower and narrower as we age. And people with dementia mostly can only focus on one thing. So there's a whole lot of internal stresses, things like that they may not be able to tell you, like they're in pain or they need to go to the toilet or they're hungry and it'll just come out in their behavior. And the other place it comes from is in the environment. And they have no control over that, like it's noise, all of those things. So if they're trying to focus on something that's functional and there's a whole lot of environmental stress, it's extremely difficult for them. Behaviour. Behaviour is a word that I'm actually trying to remove from my vocabulary around dementia. I see it as... Um, a way of communicating and they get bad press and bad labels because they have bad behavior when actually they're only trying to communicate. So when looking at behaviors that challenge, it's important to recognize that not all behavior is caused directly by the dementia. And I just mentioned a couple of examples like noise in the environment and many behaviors the normal coping strategies used by all of us to deal with difficult situations. And that's what's different about them as adults. They're not children learning to develop coping strategies. They've had a life of coping strategies and they come out, they hit a difficult situation. So one of their strategies pops out. And the behavior challenges us and service providers to find a solution because they are not going to change. People living with dementia experience changes in their ability to express and resolve their needs. And they respond from their reality. And we can't change that, as I said. All we can do is change our approach to support them 
to understand what's going on. This is a really good model to have etched on your brain. If you look in the center, we've got the challenging behavior in the middle. And I just want you to think about those other three triangles. I want you to think about the one at the top. What things in the environment can contribute to a challenging behavior? And I've already mentioned things like noise, too much noise, too much clutter, too much stimulation. Televisions, they're terrible. They are auditory, they are visual. They see things like fire engines and things and they think it's real, it's happening outside. Um, all of those sorts of things. It's an unfamiliar environment or there's poor sensory information like for some people that English is a second language um, and they want to find a toilet and they've forgotten where it is. Instead of having just the word toilet, if there's a picture there as well, it gives them two chances to be able to find the toilet. So there's lots of things um, in the environment that contribute to their behavior. Now, going on to the patient, what they bring to the equation is, well, first of all, their neurological impairment. Yes, we, they have that. The effects of the medication that they're on, impaired vision or hearing, that will challenge them. They may have an acute illness, a delirium. Um, they may be fatigued at the end of the day. I, people with dementia have told me that because they've had to put so much effort into concentrating that they're absolutely fatigued by the end of the day. It could be any of the causes of a delirium, dehydration, constipation, pain, um, anything like that. So coping strategies, cultural differences, the whole way they've been brought up, financial privileges, level of education that they've had during their life, all of those things. And then the last one, caregiver determinants. They're the things that we bring to the table. And that's our experience, our level of knowledge, um, our level of support. Have we had a break? Has anyone come and relieved us to have a break from looking after this person. Our response to stress, and it isn't the same every day, there might be something big going down at home, and it depends on our financial situation. But the more education we can get about this, the better it is for us to actually understand how to work with these people. What we need to do is to look for the meaning behind the behavior. We need to assess, not jump in and make a judgment um, statement. And the strategies that we develop, we need to develop strategies, sorry, to find a solution. We need to use tools to collect evidence because people do slap labels on them like they didn't make it to the toilet and they started crying or whatever and their behavior got really bad because they've been incontinent when actually they couldn't find the toilet. So they get a label incontinent and that isn't really what happened. Um, we can assess using pain assessments, um, anything that you use in your area of work. And if we identify something that is a trigger for this person, we need to remove it. And it might be something as simple as a particular staff member that they don't particularly like working with, or um, you work out that it's every time their visitors go home and they're trying to get out the door, okay? Well, that would be a normal thing. But if you know that, then you can work with the family to do the leaving departure thing differently so that it doesn't trigger that behavior. Don't ignore them or talk over them. If you ignore them, their behavior will escalate because they don't feel heard. Find out some information about them and personalize your response. 
And what we need to do is attend to the need, the unmet need, not the behaviour. And we can try social interaction or sensory stimulation, take them to a more low stimulus environment or do something relaxing with them. This is one of my most important mantras. And I say, all behavior has a meaning. Look for the meaning behind the behavior. Be a detective, not a judge. So I want you to just say that to yourself. All behavior has a meaning. Look for the meaning behind the behavior. Be a detective, not a judge. I'm going to look at a few different behaviors now just to show you how complicated it is for these people. So one of the common ones that you will see is resisting care. So why do people with dementia resist care? I'm actually going to put up at least 20 reasons. I'm not going to read them all out to you. This is some of them. Their mobility and dexterity is not up to scratch today. They're fatigued. They've got lack of insight. Um, they're disorientated. They're hungry. And we need to change our thinking. And it's important that we need to think. It's not that they won't do something. It's that they can't. They don't actually understand how to make it happen for whatever reason. And there's some of them. There's another whole great big list of the reasons. Their reduced ability to communicate. Um, they haven't built up any trust. And one that we quite often miss is that they can't order or sequence something that's difficult, that we think simple, like having a shower. And so the answer is no. I've already had one. So we need to think about what's behind the reasons why they might be resisting. And they come up with some very clever ideas. Here's another whole list. We haven't quite finished the whole 20. The person feels they're being talked down to or bossed about. They don't like that at all. And they want to keep some sort of sense of control. So who are you coming in to say they're taking you for a shower right now? When it is personal care, it's a very intimate activity. And privacy is important. And we have to think about their previous lifestyles. Some of these people, when you say the word shower, it means nothing to them. Because their memory, when they have their memory loss, it tends to be the more recent first. So they go back in time. Now, if they grew up without a shower in their house, it's quite possible that they don't know what you mean. Because a lot of them had a bath and they had a bath once a week. So asking them to do something like that is quite difficult. So quite often I don't use the word shower. I say, can you help me? Because they love helping. And I get them to hold their things for a shower. And I'll go for a walk with them and we'll just end up there. And we'll fiddle around and water will come out. And, and then it just happens from there on. And I have come across a lot of people that are actually washing from a bowl. And I say to the staff, does it really matter? Like they're clean. And that's possibly how they washed for quite a large part of their life when they were growing up. So you need to think about the past, where these people have come from. It's very, very important. And I'm going to give you an example about that for the next one, calling out and vocalizing. The need to communicate never, ever goes away. So I see calling out as a way that these people are trying to communicate something to me. And I'm going to talk about a man that I looked after once who kept yelling out, help, help, I'm dying, I'm dying of thirst. And he was quite distressed. And so we were giving him lots of little drinks of water. And I spoke to his daughter one day and I said to her, can you think of anything in dad's past that might be related to this? And she said, yes, he was a prisoner of war in the desert and he nearly died of thirst. 
So yes, he was yelling out, help, help, I'm um, I need a drink, I'm dying. So that was something that happened in his past. Um, other reasons that they may call out is they're in pain, they're hungry, they can't communicate that to you, or a lot of people are actually lonely or bored or depressed. I saw a lady the other day and English wasn't her first language and um, it appeared to me that she was at the end stages and very palliative and she'd started this calling out and I said, I think she's probably really scared and really frightened of being alone. And so we developed a strategy of her family coming in and some music from her own culture and tapes of people speaking in her language and it settled her down. It's much better to do that than to try and fix it with medication. And we need to acknowledge the feeling behind why they might be calling out. Sometimes it feels like they're doing it for no apparent reason. But if we go back to the three things I said, look for the meaning behind the behavior. Oh, all behavior has a meaning. Look for the meaning behind the behavior. Be a detective, not a judge. So we as nurses are really good at working out things like that what might actually be um, the reason behind this person, why they're behaving like that. But the very frustrating thing about nature is that sometimes what works today, as you know, doesn't work tomorrow. So then we're back to square one. And this was written by a person with dementia. If you learn to listen for clues as to how I feel, instead of what I say, you'll be able to understand me much better. So crying and calling out can be triggered by true distress for these people as a result of feeling lost, overwhelmed, disorientated. And yes, as I said, all vocalizing noises have a meaning. Repetitive actions, that's another one. And this can be very exhausting, as you know, and very stressful for the caregiver. They do something over and over again. They repeat the word, question, or activity. Sometimes we have to give an answer. Sometimes we have to give an answer over and over again in a reassuring way. If we ignore them, the repetitive behavior, just like the calling out, actually escalates because they're trying to connect. They're looking for comfort. They're looking for something familiar. They're looking for something secure. And they need an answer sometimes to the question, when's my mother coming? When's my mother coming? Or when can I go home? When can I go home? All of those sorts of things. This is my next one. And I find this um, quite interesting. When we talk about people with dementia, when they walk, all of a sudden it's become, it's called wandering. So we walk with a purpose, but when they walk, we're pretty quick to say they're wandering. And this um, little caption was also written by a lady with dementia. When I wander, don't tell me to come and sit down. Wander with me. Sometimes it means I'm hungry or thirsty or need the toilet. Or maybe I just need to stretch my legs. I'm going to tell you another little story of this man in hospital who was a very tall, thin man, just wandering round and round and round the ward all the time. And they knew he was quite distressed. And I said, where does he go? Does he always end up in the same place? And yes, he did. It was the kitchen. And I said, maybe he's hungry. So we gave him a packet of biscuits and he ate them very fast. And from then on, they gave him bigger meals and he stopped the behavior. Some of them don't know why they're doing it. And some of them, they're doing it because they need some exercise. Some of them, they're doing it because they're restless, the side effects of medication that they've taken. And I mean, you and I don't sit down all day. And 
I just want to bring in something from when I said things in the environment that can add to the behavior. And this is quite a common one, and it's not something we do on purpose. Just think about it. At the end of a shift, and we're all going home and we're yelling out, see ya, bye, see you tomorrow. And these people hear that and they think, huh, I'm not meant to belong here. I knew I didn't. I need to get up and go home. All their life, they've been going home. Home from school, home from work, home from wherever they were. And guess what? It says exit over and above the door. And so that's what they're doing, just responding to environmental cues that we didn't mean to um, say. And it can happen that easily. And next minute, they get labelled as someone who's trying to escape. So that's wandering. Oh, no, here's reduce the wandering, how to reduce it. So as I said, assess the place where they wander, what's happening just before it, uh, it might be that they want to go to the toilet or something like that. Validate the emotion behind the behavior. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this shortly because validation is a very good skill to have in your skill set. Distraction, prevent them um, from concentrating on something, distract them to do something else. Redirection, changing focus. Encourage safe walking. Um, some places have exercise groups. Some of them need more walking than others. But first of all, we need to ensure their needs are all met. Like they're not hungry, they don't need to go to the toilet, something like that, because the wandering might start because they haven't had a basic need met. Hallucinations and false ideas. These are very common. People with dementia often don't experience things exactly as they are. And we know that they're imaginary, but they are very, very real to the person. And you're not going to rub that out. So we need to go with how they're feeling about it. Hallucinations can be sensory experiences. They might be visual. They might be hearing. And if they're extreme and cause huge anxiety, then there's a need for specialist medication because the anxiety is terrible. But a lot of these people have friendly ones that actually, if it's not a problem, then you don't worry about it. And I've had things like I had a lady saying to me one day, look, there's blood all over the grass outside. And I looked outside and I could see what it was. And I said, oh, does that look like blood to you? And she said, yes. And she said, I don't like it. And I said, should we go out and have a look? And so we went out and had a look and it was actually autumn leaves. So we picked them up. And another lady's looking out the window and she said to me, there's a sheep out there running around. And I looked out and it did look like a sheep. It was a white plastic bag blowing around in the wind. So they see things differently to us because of what's happening in their brain. They can also be very paranoid and have um, unrealistic beliefs, beliefs that people are stealing things because they can't find them or that their partner is being um, having some sort of an affair. That's quite a big one. They, they might be living in residential care and because their partner's not there, um, they go into confabulation mode and two and two are nine. So their conclusion is they're having an affair. That's why they're not here. Um, and they can have delusions which are not based on reality. Um, and all of these things can happen to some of them. Not everybody has it but they're quite distressing for relatives, um, especially when they get blamed. But it's just what's happening for the person. It's really important not to argue with them about it or not to try and convince them that it's actually not true. We need to go with the feeling, are you upset about that? That was the blood on the lawn. Let's go and see if I can fix it. 
do you want to come with me? All of those sorts of things. Um, some of them have, I've often had people with little children outside the window, little children with dirty faces. I remember one lady telling me every night when she went to bed that she just had to throw some lollies out the window to the little children with dirty faces. So we just threw some lollies out the window every night and she was quite happy to pull her curtains and she'd grown up during the war and during the depression and she'd seen a lot of orphans and a lot of street children um, which had possibly triggered that off. So we try to respond to the underlying feelings and um, sometimes it's as easy as improving the lighting or making sure they've got their glasses on, those sorts of things. Rummaging. Don't you just love it? Rummaging around. <laughs> Rummaging can be very frustrating for us and it can make quite a mess and it's sometimes people rummage because they've hidden an item because they're frightened it's going to be stolen or they can't remember where they put it and they're constantly looking for it. Um, some of them just like to go through all their property because it reassures them it's something familiar. Some of them are lonely, some of them are bored, but for some of them it's kind of like the last control they've got over their property or things that are familiar to them. And, and they're things that have a history they're actually part of their life. And it's very important that we let them do this rummaging. Some of it can be dangerous, so we have to be careful how we do it. But I've done things like got one of those box files and put some of their favorite things in there so they can cart it around with them and rummage all over the place. But it's really important to do things like take the valuable things out, talk to the family about them, because they'll do things like, as you know, take their rings off, hide them in a pair of socks, throw the socks out in the rubbish bin, all of those sorts of things. So valuable stuff needs to be removed. And if it's photos, I mean, they love photos. We can stick them in books and all sorts of things and they cart them around. But I do suggest to families to keep the originals and photocopy them because they fold them up and they unfold them and they stuff them in drawers and you find them in rubbish bins. But they're familiar items to them and it's something reassuring in their life. And hoarding or acquiring things or light fingeredness. When these people move into residential care, They've moved from a whole house where everything was theirs and every room was theirs. So it's very difficult for them to know where boundaries stop and start and whose stuff is whose. And you will know that stuff goes, everything has legs on it and it moves around and um, sometimes they hoard it because they're anxious that they're not sure if they're ever going to see it again. Um, and sometimes it's a response to feeling isolated or it gives them some sort of purpose that they're collecting things or putting things away for the future. And some people may have had a little bit of a lifelong tendency to do this and it just might get a lot worse when they've got dementia. I've just come from a house this morning that I'm a little bit worried about. And all the pets have moved inside, including five cages of birds. So um, that's going to be a nice challenging thing. So once again, don't try to use logic to dissuade them. They'll just get upset. Don't take the stuff off them. You need to try and find some way to incorporate a level of it in their life because a lot of people as you know when they move into residential care they pack their bags and unpack their bags and they're always going home and i say i just leave them doing it because it's giving them a purpose it's their stuff 
And yes, it gets too late at night and they can't go home now. So let's unpack it to keep it safe. And then the next day it all starts all over again. Or does it matter if they use their suitcase as a drawer for a while until they feel more settled? I had a um, son the other day that came up with an idea for his mother because she was moving the suitcases all around her room and she was nearly blind and she was tripping over everything. And he attached her suitcase to a little table that he had so that she could still rummage, but so that it wasn't all over the floor and she wasn't tripping over it. And yeah, I was quite impressed with what he, his answer that he came up with. He, he knew his mother needed to do that. I have to mention pain here because pain management for people with dementia is very, very important. There's been a lot of research done on this and these people get far less pain relief than other people, even in hospital, if they're having a hip replacement, something like that, um, because they don't ask. They don't ask, they, they don't know how to ask, um, people don't pick it up, they think their behaviour might mean something else when it's actually because they're in pain. Yeah, it's often really, really underestimated. And I don't know if any of you use the Abbey Pain Scale or other non-verbal pain scales that have been developed for people with dementia that actually can't tell us, but it's really important. And if someone's charted paracetamol and you think that they might be in pain, sometimes it pays to just give them some and see. And if they settle down, then that might be what it actually was. You know, they don't tell you when they've got a headache, um, any of those things. And yes, it's very sad. So if we don't get on top of their pain, they can have mood changes, uh, behavior changes, a lot of unexplained distress, and it can come out as aggression, depression, they become isolated and move away from other people, they can have a lot more falls because they're focusing on the pain but they don't know they're doing that, or they won't eat, they stop eating and um, yeah, they might get treated for something else because of their behavior or their mood when it's actually underlying pain. A good way to think about that is arthritis. If they're a person that has arthritis and you know that, then I would be thinking pain, untreated pain. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the validation theory. It was developed in the 1960s and 70s by a woman called Naomi Feel. And what she teaches is empathizing with people who have dementia by communicating through patience, listening, and observation. And she's got a practical way of connecting with them to reduce their stress. And it helps us to learn the meaning behind some of the behaviors. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this. And one of them is a common thing where they're going, um, where's my husband? Where's my husband? When's he coming back? When am I going home? All of those sorts of things. What we do is we need to go in and validate the feeling. You sound unhappy. You sound distressed. You sound upset. And we offer them some support. And then we start talking to them like, tell me about your husband. What is it that you miss about your husband? And you move slowly through like that so that they can unburden themselves and talk about it. Tell me about your mother. What were, the, what were your favorite? And then you move into more positive things eventually. What were the fa your favorite things that you like doing with your mother? Was it cooking a favorite meal, something like that? 
and bring them on to something more positive until they're, however they're feeling, they feel a lot better. And then you can redirect them or distract them away to do something else. If we just go, oh no, your mother's, she's coming at two o'clock or no, your mother's not coming today or your mother's dead. Yes, let me use that dead example. Um, we used to be taught years ago to reorientate them to reality. Your mother's dead. Well, instead of that now, because a lot for a lot of them, it's a shock and they go straight into, nobody told me that. I didn't go to the funeral. I don't believe what you're saying, all of those sorts of things. But if they're talking about their mother, then we talk about their mother. You sound sad. You sound like you're missing your mother. What is it that you miss? And so that's the technique that I'm telling you about um, that's become really important. So if you get an opportunity, look up that lady's theory and, um, you know, you can get quite good at practicing it. It's something that you can practice because it, it makes them feel listened to. It makes them feel supported. It makes them feel heard and treated as a person. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is person-centered support. It's really, really important to actually find out things about a person so that we can bring it into everyday conversation when we're working with them. Um, one of the things I do when I'm going towards someone is the first thing I do is I smile and that's my barometer. And if I don't get a smile back, I get a message that says, go slowly, be careful, we're not happy. And then I use their name. I use their name a lot because it gives them the message of someone knows who I am and I'm meant to be here. So, and then I'll talk about something that I know is important to that person. How's the garden today? You know how you love gardening? Show me what's happening out in the garden. And you bring conversations in that are person-centered to that person. Or you can get people to come, like volunteers are very useful. And some family members, most families really want to help. And you can say, well, it'd be really nice if you took mum for a walk out in the garden, you know, when you come to visit. Um, that's something she likes doing and, and we run out of time to do it every day. And just try and find things that are particular to that person. The next theorist I'd like to talk about is Tom Kitwood, and I do hope you've all heard about him. He is probably one of the lead, he's one of the leaders in person-centered care that he really brought to people's minds that dementia was more than just what was happening in the brain. That um, it was more than plaques and tangles. And this is his flower. And he said, this is what these people need in their life. Comfort, identity, occupation, inclusion, attachment, and a central need for love. Now, we all need that, not just people with dementia. And there are ways we can provide this, like, well, inclusion. There's a thing that some people with dementia do called shadowing, where they follow you around everywhere. Well, apparently, if they do that to you, then they feel safe with you. They feel like you're going to respond well, you're going to include them in things, all of those sorts of things. And they have some sort of attachment and it brings comfort to them, a sense of identity, and it's giving them something to do. So you don't have to do big things to include this. So Kitwood is another person you can go and look up. He has some amazing um, theories on personhood and he's really been the person that has brought positive person work 
to the foreground when working with people with dementia. How you can make a difference? Individualised person-centred care, a culture of caring where you work that prioritises the quality of life. Like if it's something small and annoying, does it really matter? Just let it go if it's helping that person with dementia. Make sure your assessments are accurate, involve their family and friends, create a social and physical environment that changes when their needs change. Don't expect them to be able to do the same thing every day. Sometimes their needs change. We're not the same every day. Focus on early intervention. If you don't answer someone or respond or use validation, it will, their behavior will escalate out of control. And then it's gonna take you twice as long to actually reduce their anxiety and um, focus on staff education. Look some of these people up that I've mentioned and share the information with each other and do more of what you do that works well because you people work in the area and there's a lot of things that you know and that you know about people. If it works well, do it more. If it doesn't work, make sure the next person knows about it so they don't repeat the same mistake. This came from Tom Kitwood. I mentioned personhood and dignity is really, really important. When dignity is present for these people, they feel in control, they feel valued, they feel confident, they feel comfortable to make decisions for themselves. When it's not there, they feel devalued, lacking control, humiliated, ashamed, lacking in confidence and struggle to make decisions for themselves. You wouldn't ask a blind person to read, so why would you ask a person with dementia to remember? And this is really important because there's other things that happen in dementia with their brain. It's not just memory, it's logic, it's reasoning, all of that. So why do we try and make them reason to see our logic? It's remember, I said it's not that they won't do it, it's that they can't do it. So if we remind them all the time that they can't remember, then that really upsets them. So I never say, remember me, I was here yesterday. I say, hi, I'm Yvonne every day. And if they say, yes, I saw you yesterday, I say, oh, yes, great, that's good. Over time, dementia affects a person's entire life. It causes the brain to shrink and stop working. It steals memories, the most recent first, but eventually almost all. It steals the ability to use language. It steals the ability to understand what others mean and say. It steals reasoning and logic. It robs people of relationships, relationships that they once had and forming new relationships. It makes even the familiar seem odd and scary. It steals the ability of people to care for themselves and move around safely. It robs people of impulse control and takes away emotional and mood control. One thing dementia does not rob someone of their dignity, it's our reaction to them that robs them of their dignity. So it's important to remember that. This lady, Tipa Snow, she has a lot of really good videos you can watch on YouTube and um, she is very good at teaching around behaviours. And Tom Kitwood has also written a lot of stuff about dignity, positive person work. Um, and he also talks about a thing called malignant social psychology. And that's the way people are treated that robs them of their dignity. That was just fabulous, Yvonne.
Oh, good. Just a, a wonderful, comprehensive look at all those challenges that people have every day and thinking beyond what's in front of you to some of the possible causes. It was, like, it was great. For all of you that have been listening today, I know that you will have really appreciated that. And in fact, once you watch the recording again, you'll probably pick up more again. Mm -hmm. So um, just a reminder that you will be able to access the first and the second session, hopefully by next week. And we will be sending out a survey uh, to your email and that would really help us for ongoing sessions. And I think uh, we will be doing something at the end of April. I think it's going to be me. I'm going to be looking at communication. So not just communication with the person with dementia, but the family and also with the staff because they are all talented. So um, I think that's all from us. And so from Kathy, who's in the background there, and Hi. Yvonne and I, um, thanks to those that have had uh, chats. I am seeing them. And uh, I hope you've got a lot out of this. Goodbye. Great. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. I think um, it's one of the secrets to working with these people is actually getting more knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. But always remembering that your heart has to be open. Exactly. Yeah. And your thank ears open. Yeah. Thank you.